this is the part where I tell you how you can support the show. Head on over to freemanbeyondthewall.com forward slash support. There are many ways there that you can support the show. The best way is on that website. If you go right to the store, you can do that annually or monthly, or you can just send something in the mail. It's P.O. Box 413, Lineville, Alabama, 36266. I always enjoy reading the letters. They really mean a lot to me, and I save every single one of them, and I try to respond in some way to each and every one. So I just want to thank everybody for making it possible for me to do this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to welcome everyone back to the Piquinones show for the first time on the show. I'm my friend Charlie Wagner here. How you doing, Charlie? Hello, Pete. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. So this is uh, this is interesting because you reached out to me a while back and you were like, do you mind if I republish your sub stacks in my local newspaper? And I was like, I don't know if that's the greatest idea, but sure, you can go right ahead and do that. So um, what, what, let's start off talking about that. I mean, what gave you the idea to like take over a newspaper and start running it? Yeah, lucky accident here. So I moved to this small, very white, very conservative county in Idaho. And newspapers, you probably know, are just generally all dying and they can't really afford to hire anybody good. Um, And so, of course, on the higher levels of journalism, you know, it's already a disaster. But at the lower levels, it's kind of mom and pop, uh, mom and pop operations that have been I guess uh, conglomerated, and now they're they're all just withering a slip on the vine and dying a slow death. So year over year declines are brutal. There's basically no profit to be had, and the companies that run these things are all just trying to squeak by. So I thought it would be a fun project. The editor here retired, and I have, I guess, based on uh, our guy st- style politics, I have a desire to uh, kind of will tell the locals what's coming. So I came here about five years ago from the Southwest. And I think there's a complacency in Idaho based on, uh, you know, it's 90% Republican. So all you have to do is vote red and everything's going to be fine. And of course, you and I are going to think that's not, that's not the answer. And and, and in fact, it it leads to a, a complacency among them where they get the rug pulled out completely. And it'll be the kind of deal where it's uh slowly and then all all at once and you see that happening just over the border in utah where there's just massive demographic shift if you go six months and then six months later you can see it you you see the demographic change before your eyes so that's just across the border Um, i'm trying to use the use the newspaper to uh push them a little bit i hope that wasn't long-winded nope that was fine um well the thing is i wanted to ask was from what i understand i mean from our interactions you're not you don't really get any pushback on what i write uh so what kind of pushback have you gotten yeah your stuff is fantastic at uh i mean saying the right things in a palatable way and just because they're coming from a disposition of uh you know farming conservative christianity you're not going to really offend them uh but you might teach them new things and i think um yeah i did i did rub a few people the wrong way because i i don't have probably quite the soft touch with words that you do so in the first year that i ran the paper i was running op-eds every week on page two where you know if it's our guys they're gonna love it and they're gonna laugh and say i can't believe you got away with that but you're gonna end up uh alienating people as well so one of the blessings of having you in the paper is uh, it let me step back and let you do it in a more uh, deft and diplomatic way. So I, I know you think your stuff's off the wall, but I think it really uh, toes the line nicely. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. That's the it's the hard part, you know. Even even in podcasting, it's like, what do you? Uh, <laughs> how, how far how far can you go? I mean, I I don't want to ever fed post because I mean I just don't think that that's the answer in most cases. And uh, but um, you know, it's that that fine line of how many rails can you just put your toe on real quick without drawing the ire of uh, whoever, whomever, you know, whomever. 
um, especially the people who um, <laughs> can get your bank, get control of your bank accounts and stuff like that. Yeah, well, it's great right now and that they're, I mean, taking fire from all directions. So I think you had a situation before where, you know, I got our guys are kind of waiting in the grass for something to develop. But now with Twitter going like it is, I mean, it's it's uh, it's everybody has the cover of other people's fire, which is magnificent. So, I mean, and the things that would have seemed completely unsayable in a newspaper um, two years ago, you can say now. So great opportunity. And it's our I think it's our duty to uh, seize it and join the fight. What's funny is not 10 minutes before we started recording. Yeah, you know, I was on Twitter and uh, Dave, the distributist was was tweeting and he's talking about how it seems like classical liberals and libertarians are spiraling on the timeline. I mean, they're like attacking anyone who, you know, right now they're attacking Tucker because Tucker said, you know, this is you know what we see as the fault of of capitalism. And, you know, libertarians and classical liberals jump right to, well, that's not real capitalism, just basically like communists do when they say that's not that wasn't real communism. And so not only are you seeing ever since like October 7th, this just open conversation about the, you know, the people who sh shall not be named and you couldn't name them. Well, now people are like, well, let's let's have this discussion. It seems like now everything's on the table, classical liberalism, libertarianism. It's like we know this stuff doesn't work and. It's I don't know if I said it publicly or said it in a in a sub stack. I can't remember where I said it, but I said and I've been saying this for a while, but trying to remind people lately is. It looks like we're going to have two choices in the future. It's going to be left authoritarianism or right authoritarianism. And what you should be doing in your private life first is preparing for either one. And. If you think it's going to be anything other than those two, you're completely out of the game and you are not paying attention. Yeah, well said. I, I mean, you have a much better red history on libertarianism. I came from a similar spot philosophically. I mean, I wasn't as uh, involved or, or deeply as deeply read as you were five years ago, 10 years ago. But in the last five years, I don't know how people of a libertarian mindset have hung on to it. Um, you know, 2016, it made sense still. But then the following two and three years and then through COVID, all the blinders should be off. And yeah, I guess it's uh, they're, they're still watching a different uh, different show and trying to fit um, observations into a worldview. That I, it, it's similar to the leftist mindset. They'll they'll see something um, and managed to totally invert what uh, the meaning of that is to what you and I would think. And so, uh, yeah, if you're maintaining libertarian uh, principles at this point, it, you're pretty tough to talk to. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, there are some libertarians out there who really get it and really, but it's like, do you really understand where we're going? Because where we're going is you Somebody who just keeps on going with libertarianism and just keeps spouting that, spouting that, I mean, you get to the point where they're going to look at you and they're going to be either side, left or right authoritarianism. are going to be like, you're not on our side. And yeah. um, you know, I mean, and if you are if you're that principled, if you're so principled in your libertarianism, which will never exist, which is not going to exist, I mean, not in your lifetime, not in your kid's lifetime, probably. You're looking at probably evolutionary changes in order for that to work. Or you're going to have to rethink libertarianism as and think about its gate, what needs to be, how it needs to be gate kept if it is going to be, um, if it is going to manifest. You have to think about the fact that how principled are you? Because if you start getting targeted, you're not being targeted right now. If you're a classical liberal or a libertarian, you're not a threat. They don't see you as a threat. Yeah, you're but, serving serving the same purposes. Open borders are great. The yeah. I mean, Milton, like who, who would still enjoy Milton Friedman economics at this point? I mean, you're seeing the outcome. It's basically native populations can't afford housing anymore. That's that's the outcome. I mean, Paul, Paul Krugman, who pushed 
you know, classical liberal economics forever. He he doesn't even pretend anymore. How are the libertarians still still pushing that? I don't know. Yeah. Well, let's let's use that as a jumping off point because one of the things I sent you was the the trailer for this new Civil War movie, and it's <laughs> it's pretty interesting. The I'll just um, I guess we'll play it. I shared screen on it. We'll play it. Um, if you want to comment on anything, tell me to stop it, and I, and I'll um, and you can comment on it. Um, if not, I'll just play it all the way through, and then we can uh, we can talk a little bit about it. And you said you can even you even have some ideas about in the real world right now where you could possibly look at pockets and see something like this um, beginning. So um, I'm just going to start it. Okay. Yep. Fire away. 19 states have seceded. The United States Army ramps up activity. The White House issued warnings to the Western forces as well as the Florida Alliance. The three-term president assures the uprising. You notice how they put three-term president in there? Yeah, and this is something, too. I mean, I don't know if this is planted comments and uh, reviews, but it's like, man, this... this uh, Whoever the director is, the English guy who wrote also Ex Machina... Um, He's, you know, he's going to be subtle and where is he going with this? But what there's a complete lack of subtlety that that's going to be. I mean, that's my overarching thing is there's really not much surprising in here. But uh, also, I'm not getting the audio for what it's worth. I I guess it doesn't matter because you're going to edit that. Oh, you're not getting the audio. That's weird. Okay. Luckily, I can read the caps, closed okay. captions. All right, let's go. We'll be dealt with swiftly. Let me know if you want to try anything. OK, stop a second. Do you want to stop as we go? Yeah, you can this do that. Was, sure. So yeah, this is the one uh, attractive white in the thing. So to me, the archetypes are all exactly what you'd expect. You've got here like a relatively relatively suave fit Latino dude, um, but the whites, including like, like the obvious two villains, which are the the pompous haircut president, and then you've got the militia guy later who with the red sunglasses on, who are. They're not attractive guys. Here you've got the one instance in the trailer where it's an attractive white person. And she's the one that I'm, I haven't totally wrapped my head around what her role is. But she's going to say, uh, I, I should I should let her say it first. Let me know if you want to try anything on. Are you guys aware there's like a pretty huge civil war going on all across America? We just try to stay out. What do you think her what do you think her spot is there? Uh, we just try to stay out of it. Um. I don't know. I, it's basically, to me, it's like the white indifference. That's the problem. And so uh, if you're the person that identifies with that, it's, it's the whole, like, if you're not anti-racist, you're racist. And so I, I, and I'm not sure that's right, but she's just the one character in it. Who's not just the clear white power structure or the, the multi culty brigades against it. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. That makes sense. All right. Shout if you need to stop again with what we see on the news seems like it's for the best citizens of america the so-called western forces of texas and california have suffered a very great defeat at the hands of the united states military mr president do you regret the use of airstrikes against american citizens We're moving to D.C. today. We need to go down there. They shoot journalists on sight in the Capitol. The Capitol sounds pretty based. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Every instinct in me says this is death. Bloody. Every time I survived the war zone, I thought I was sending a warning home. Don't do this. But here we are. There's some kind of misunderstanding here. What? Well, you're American, okay? Okay. What kind of American are you? You don't know? So the best, the best thing that I saw on Twitter, and I wish I could give the person uh, credit for it, they posted up a picture of that guy, and they said, is that if you get clipped by Elton John with a single point, you're not going to heaven. <laughs> yeah this and this one 
further to the point of uh, if they had made this an attractive guy, I I guess if you're into film these days, everybody knows this this actor and they think he's fantastic, but he's not a classically attractive human being. He makes a good villain. And the only thing missing in this scene is dueling banjos and what kind of American are you, nigger? Like, you know, <laughs> it, there's, there's not subtlety in this scene to my eye. Yeah. The Western forces will reach the White House on July 4th. Oh, my God. Get in the car! Get in the car! Move, move, move! You're gonna hang back. I'm not hanging back. One nation under God. Indivisible. With liberty and justice for all. Go, 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 go. God bless America. All right, so... You notice the scenes of Apocalypse at the opening are less and less divergent from just shit you'd see in America now? Say like that the, again? The scene of just, it's supposed to give you the opening visual of just total chaos with cars strewn about the highway you know it's, it's just less and less hard hitting these days because if you had seen that same scene 30 years ago you'd see okay clearly there's been some kind of uh you know uh, apocalypse event but now it just looks like it looks like the suburbs of oakland or something the the, the visual doesn't hit as hard when we're already there well you know it's one of those things too where so that I guess the tagline at the end there is all empires fall. And this is the, the thing that you're the question that you're not ever allowed to ask about anything happening in the world, anything happening and happening in culture is why. Is it going to address why empires fall and is it going to do it in a truthful way? Of course not. No, yeah. I'm all about the why it's like, Sure. Three buildings fell on on 9-11. Great. I, I only want to know why 9-11 happened. Well, I want to know who was... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, for what it's worth, I mean, they view this as a, an aspirational line, I think. and But to them, it's it's the fall of the white power structure. Um, right. And so, yeah, the, the, with the... I mean, it's so clearly, uh, would you say, Roman Clay of, of Trump, he is the... The with you pointed out the three term president. So oh he's gonna clearly this guy just uh canceled the twenty second amendment and made himself a dictator. So I think people who think they don't I think a lot of people think, oh, it's these like right wing militias are I, I I don't know if that's lost to everyone, but in the comments they can't tell that it's obviously a multi culty gang against the white empire. So um, you know, the uh, the accelerationists on our side who want to see the empire fall being global homo you you basically both have both people rooting for the fall of the empire but they just have completely inverted visions of what that empire is yeah i mean we're we're over here we're like we just want we want the safety and the prosperity of our own people uh people that we share share values with um and they're you know it's like i said in the last last episode that i re released is like they're literally they want safety for sodomites they want sodomy to reign they want um all of these things that destroy the founding culture the culture uh, a culture that actually brings about civilization and don't think that well sodomy is what they if they keep power what the focus will be 10 years from now That'll just be in the background. That'll just be accepted. They'll be on to the next thing. What all, is the it, next thing? all of these things that they're pushing, all of these things that they, when they talk about defending democracy, we know it's not defending democracy. We know it's not defending. It's defending whatever they're pushing forward in a, so that they can get the kind of chaos and destruction of this the founding civilization what actually brought about civilization because i mean let's face it at this point 
their it seems their goal is just to rule over the ashes. Yeah. I think I mean there's a there's I think you've said on your show at one time, uh, you know, they, they surely they don't want to ruin their own society. They have to live in it too. But for the people who are really calling the shots, that's not true. They can move freely and they essentially create the Manhattan model wherever they go. They they can live safely above or behind gates uh where you've got the you know their golems destroying everything and but the the destruction in fact accrues to the profit of the people doing it and so yeah i mean i guess it, it depends who you mean by they but the large masses of they i don't think give it any thought um as far as uh intentional destruction i think they they buy the rhetoric of uh you know enhancing their freedoms and baby murder is in fact uh women's reproductive rights you know all you have to do is just give them the correct rhetoric and they they think they're on the side of good and justice and i don't think the mass of them view themselves as destructive i mean they even have right wingers quote unquote right wingers defending like satanic statues in in public you know you you never see how often do these right wingers quote unquote Talk, speak up when like in Arkansas they're trying to remove the Ten Commandments from um, I believe it's the judicial building and you don't hear them concentrating on that but if it's something that has like if even these people who say oh I'm I'm a Christian and it's like well a Christian as a Christian you should probably want to go in there and grind that thing to dust you know and piss on it in the middle of the street and yeah. that that'll make that that'll make a really good statement i also think that it's a really good witness <laughs> you know i mean maybe i'm weird but when you see them defending it and going no no by tearing this down you're on the side of christian nationalism which they don't even understand what that means um you know so they just straw man straw man the position um yeah i don't when the enemies are, you know, it's like that, the meme with it's when you're in tug of war and you, you realize like, you know, the, um, the capitalists and you know, the quote unquote capitalists and the, um, and the commies are on the same side pulling against you. Yes. And you're like, wait a minute, how does this work? It's like, well, you're, when you, when we look at our side, people that we, well, they're on our side, they, Sir, clearly are not they, when it comes down to sure they're on our side when they're talking about kids shouldn't have their dicks chopped off boys shouldn't have their dicks chopped off girls shouldn't have their tits chopped off yeah sure you're on the side you're not doing you're not trying to do anything to stop that but when somebody does step up and do something no you can't you're not allowed to do that yeah i, I have to admit i i like watching the conservatives squirm on this one just seeing right in front of your face how the constitution is used to destroy your own society it, it, and this of course is not this is not new this is what george carlin and the like larry flint were doing 50 years ago is basically using these tricks of free speech to uh slowly chip away at decent christian society and so now it's happening again i think it's good i mean i don't it it at some point they have to get past the the constitution because you have essentially an identical constitution in Liberia, and Liberia, for some reason, has a magically different society. Yeah, yeah. It um, the um, what was I going to say? Oh, so launching off this civil war thing, this movie and everything. Um, you said that you you left the south the southwest to go to Ohio. Were you in a um a an area that was densely populated yeah so uh it's idaho rather than ohio that was i said oh, i'm sorry i i know it's idaho i yeah just misspoke. Um, i came from uh vegas most recently and vegas was my first uh place i fled so i grew up in small town california and to my boomer parents credit i mean my dad's past and my mom pretty much goes she doesn't want to hear the types of things i would talk about at the thanksgiving dinner table but to their credit, when things got black and criminal in the Los Angeles uh, suburbs, they moved to the mountains. And so I had a, a like a pretty idyllic childhood of 
you know, no, there were no cops needed. Every, there are no, you, there are no rules. You just learn by sense the way a country kid does. You don't learn by rules the way a city kid does. And there are, you know, like two minorities in, in the entire school of a thousand. And it was like Michelle Kwan and her sister. That was the way that school was. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, and, um, <laughs> the ethno state and well, it's also the, the only everybody understands the laws they don't really need to be written down you only have to you know, the only reason you would write them down is to formalize them you know, it's people understand that this is the way we act this is what we do this is who we are amen yeah and, yeah and i think now that part of the panic in idaho is that they they think they're gonna uh, legislate their way out of what's coming and you know like like slapping rules on who can build what and how what you can do with your property um that's not the way it works if if anything that will speed the uh the california situation by just you know wrecking people with with uh regulation because one thing that happens is the locals abide try to abide by the rules the newcomers don't give a shit and so in las vegas where i spent the last 15 years prior to coming to idaho you'll have for example white contractors who have to file taxes hire legal workers and their competition is brown guys who will just come do the same job and don't worry about taxes. They don't worry about licenses and they'll charge you half the price. What, what's the, I mean, and yeah, if you're a Milton Friedman economist or you're an open borders guy, great. This is, you know, good for the consumer, good competition, but it's going to, it's going to wreck your society. What if you're the type of guy who wants to play by the rules, you will be destroyed. Yeah. You were mentioning earlier about, um, um, George Carlin and people like that. I, I love to bring this paragraph from Edward Bernays' The Engineering of Consent up all the time because it really, it's a knife. It, it's a dagger in the heart of you know, free speech and the First Amendment and civic nationalism. The first paragraph of his um, 1947 essay, The Engineering of Consent, says, freedom of speech and its democratic corollary of free press have tacitly expanded our Bill of Rights to include the right of persuasion. This development was an inevitable result of the expansion of the media of free speech and persuasion. All these media provide open doors to the public mind. Any one of us through these media may influence the attitudes and actions of our fellow citizens. And yeah. well, good. Whoever can seize the seize the stage and provide the best rhetorical tricks is going to win every time. And so, even now, you're just seeing conservatives on their heels. That's true among whites in Idaho who, who you. They uh, have excellent native distrust of outsiders. That's really good. That's going to be to their benefit. But they, but they, they're on the rhetoric level. They don't understand how the word racism is used against them. So e here you've got a group um, that's trying to, you know, return to constitutional conservatism and get rid of the rhinos. And that group is called Stand Up for Idaho. So I went to one of their events up in Idaho Falls. And uh, what do you get? You get. Uh, a, an introductory speaker who's a refugee from Iraq talking about how, you know, she was abused so badly by Saddam and uh, America took her in. And it's, it's always America. It's a country of refugees and God bless America. And uh, so that's the introduction of the, I mean, the, the, you've got a, an audience that's entirely white Christian conservative and they, they just, they're just like on their knees to hear this Brown person praise white conservatism and it's, i mean it's essentially a neocon message of we did the right thing in iraq um and then the main speaker was uh who's who's the uh dinesh d'souza and more of the oh. same i mean th this is i mean these are the guys who like who think we're the constitution we're the real right wingers that are getting rid of the rhinos this is what you get you get an iraqi refugee and you get dinesh d'souza anti-racist Anti-racist Dinesh D'Souza, yeah, the yeah. I mean, guy yeah. who got the guy who got Sam Francis canceled. Uh, yeah. yeah, this story is unknown to me, but uh, yeah, so the absolute oh, yeah. state of uh, Idaho conservatism. You do have good guys here. I think uh, you mentioned just in your last stream some trying to get a hold of Vincent James. I think he's a good guy doing good things. Yeah, 
Yeah, the um that paragraph that I read, the last one says, any one of us through these media may influence the attitudes and actions of our fellow citizens. And that's one thing that our side is, has to figure out how to do. It has to figure out how it has to get through its skull that you're going to have to use propaganda to win. Um, I'm, are you familiar with the uh, the documentary? It's like 10 hours, 11 hours, uh, Europa, the final stand. Of course. Yeah, of course. Um, so I was just taking, yeah, you know, how there was a bunch of quotes in there and everything. And I like took pictures of the quotes on my TV and, Cropped them and turned them into memes and uh, put them put them on Twitter. And a bunch of guys on our side, and I'm talking about dissident right guys, are like, well, that's not a real quote. That's not real. So fucking what? <laughs> I'm not sure the answer there, because I've heard that the guy, I mean, I think the guy crushed it for a one man effort. As I understand that was whoever put that together was yeah. just a champion. And I think he probably didn't do an academic level of fact checking himself. So there are probably a couple whiffs in there. So you you could I can understand why people might object, but all in all, that work is fantastic. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just the thing. It's like, okay, you have some propaganda against us every single day. I mean, you go back and um I was reading a reading a paper that I'm gonna do an episode on with Dr. Matthew Raphael Johnson a historical events that everyone takes as actually happened. And it's 99% inverted. Yeah. It, and, it's really mind blowing. Uh, and, but you throw a quote out there that, Oh, that's not a real quote that can't be attributed because uh, where's the attribute. Can you shut up? Can you shut up? Yeah. Do you, can you figure out how to use propaganda once in a while? How to change people's minds? Because the people who want to cut your kids' dicks and tits off, they don't care if they're put what they're putting out. Yeah. Well, I mean, for I kind of like the anal fact checkers on our side because you, you don't you don't want to be dismissed as being uh, errant or or uh sloppy because then all the good stuff you're doing is going to get thrown out with it and for what and that's also what that's exactly what they do against us is you know like like uh Hitler, hitler's quote about uh the big the big lie all they did is you know he, he's describing jewish behavior but then they attribute that to his aspiration it's it, it and so we i think it is important to not do that ourselves we honesty is important and checking ourselves is important so I mean I, I haven't seen the instances you're talking about, but uh, and I also I'm an editor, so sorry if I'm taking the wrong side of this one. Well, here's the thing: is I checked the quotes and I found the um, I found where they were attributed, and it's attributed to like somebody, um, you know, it's like you know you know Hitler's table talk, right? Not in depth. Yeah, yeah, it's. So it, it was like a it was something like that. It's like, well, the the secretary said that this was said and everything and, and everything. And it's like and it was written in this book and that's where they got it from and everything. And it's like, guys, come on. It's it, <laughs> I understand. I, I understand the whole the whole thing of, oh, I want to make sure that I'm putting the right information out there. But I mean, was the thrust of your message at true to the source or well, it was, to, yeah, I'm just directly quoting this source. And so everybody is attacking the source. Yeah, I, I don't understand that. I mean, uh, yeah, I guess I would, I would want to read the thread. Um, yeah. I understand your point. Yeah. So, I mean, I understand as an editor. I mean, I don't want to put, you know, when I put my sub stack out, I make sure that if I'm going to quote, so, there are many times I went to quote something in a sub stack and then I started looking and I'm like, eh, that's just, Hmm, I'm wrong on this one. I mean, I'm, I got to I got to remove two whole paragraphs and pretty much start over again. But I've done it and everything. But like a quote here that you can find, even if it's um, even if it's something like that's anecdotal, it's like, well, that was just somebody saying that they overheard them say this and everything like that. Let it go. I mean, that's half. I, I would be willing to bet that half of the quotes that people um 
throw out there like historic quotes and everything. If you start looking, um, if you start trying to nail down where they came from, they have become apocryphal really fast. Yeah, or they themselves were kind of borrowing a line. One of the best on our side is probably the most frequently misattributed. The uh, to find out who rules you, yeah, ask yeah. who you cannot, who you can't cur- criticize, and that's uh, they all put Voltaire or something on it, and that that does not diminish the truth of the sentiment. But I think it was Kevin Alfred Strom, and he gets. Yeah, he, I, I don't know Strom. if people just they don't want to use. His, I don't know if he's not uh, not notorious enough or they don't like him <laughs> but for some reason they won't give him proper credit well i remember someone posted that on twitter posted it on, on, like someone on our side posted it on twitter and and, I, and attributed it to voltaire and i put actually that's strom and they deleted it and didn't retweet it but putting giving strom yeah credit. As, as if that diminishes the truth of the statement it's a really wonderful statement I mean, and one hundred percent true. So there you go. So, I mean, so, so, so there you're on the on my side of things, where it's worth giving the guy his credit and getting it correct. But but to your earlier point, the fact I mean that that doesn't uh, discount the value of the statement. I don't know why the person wouldn't leave it up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as long as you can have an attribution uh, attribution somewhere. I mean, it's you know, it's like I was quoting um, uh, was it early medieval history of. Uh, of Jewish policy in Europe. And I mean, this is a, a book is a te- college textbook. And somebody on Twitter was like, Oh, well, that guy's an anti-Semite. I'm like, that doesn't mean anything in there's even if he was. And I mean, I checked, I couldn't find out. I, I didn't see any accusations. How does that dispel the historicity of what he wrote? Yeah, and I, I mean, if the best thing about 2023 is the obliteration of the utility of that word, I hope. Yeah, yeah. It's like, what does that even mean anymore? You know, it's like, define your terms. What does that mean? Oh, you hate Jews. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, if I did, why would I? Yeah. Okay. One... I, I'm not even saying, I, I'm not saying I hate Jews, but if I did, why would I? <laughs> and, and why would a country in 500 AD expel them and a country in 1500 AD, a thousand miles away, who never had any contact with that one, expel them for the same exact reasons? Mass coincidental irrationality. You know, I mean, <clears throat> oh God, it's so it's so frustrating because you once you when you start asking questions like that when you start when when you start studying history when you really get into it it's like when you can actually say well this happened in this year and this is why this happened this is why they said it happened and the, where are you getting that from the jewish virtual library well that's because they were anti-semitic uh, okay yeah um but they're, they're they're looking for a reason to discount it and if they they're they're not really looking to be satisfied and they're looking they'll they'll then move along to another reason it's no good yeah and the whole thing about oh you just hate jews and everything like that i like what he michael jones says about that he's like "Eh, i mean you you can't you have to have a term you can't just be you know it's like when they say germany invaded poland not every german invaded. not all germans yeah yeah yeah, you know, it's like, well, it, it's like, in you know, you have to talk about what, what are you talking about? You're talking about political Jewry, international, you know, what? what well, right. Um, and once you start allowing once you start allowing the segmentation, then the whack-a-mole game begins where depending on what the problem is, they'll say, oh, no, no, that's not that's the religious Jews. That's that's you know, that's not us. Oh, that problem. No, that's the secular Jews. That Oh, that's the Hollywood Jews. So then no one's responsible for anything. It, it becomes an impossible you discussion well i put a i put a tweet out i put a tweet out on twitter this morning uh, trying basically trying to explain that without saying it in so many words i said that it i said it doesn't escape me that americans are trained to see any action taken by a chinese person to be a potential act of another country's government you know buying up farmland buying a building something like that yet when someone who identifies with another group take similar actions they are forced to be judged they have to be judged as an individual yeah i i mean for what it's worth there there is some marginal protection for every group that's not whites even you'll you know 
you, you would get a little blowback to on uh, pointing out group characteristics of anybody except whites. But but uh, of course, top of the heap is our favorite friends. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's remarkable that the right will the, the right is so focused in on like the Chinese. It's like. You know, it's I, I even said when there was I was going to a church in Auburn and they had announced that they were moving into they were growing and they're moving into a bigger building. And they said that they were selling the building to a Chinese, the Chinese Bible study that meets in that school. And my the first thing out of my mouth to my wife was the Chinese government just bought this building. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure the lines are easy to, to draw on who on who is doing what. I, and there's a story I would like to tell, but uh, probably got to limit it. But in Vegas, the Chinese uh, interest is very strong. And so let me just tell this in a way. OK, so Obama in 2008 or nine, whenever they're doing the economic recovery, they created tax incentives for foreign investors in what they called targeted economic zones. So places that needed an inflow of capital, if you could uh, provide a certain amount of jobs or just money to a project, you would get a green card for yourself and your family. So uh, Jewish dudes run over to uh, China and start putting on seminars saying, hey, uh, basically put in, I think the number was 400,000. It was, if you did it in these certain zones for $400,000, uh, you will get a green card. I don't know if it was a green card or anyway, temporary, but uh, you and your family get to come live in America. So they're basically selling, to, I mean, at some point down the road, selling U.S. citizenship, $400,000 a pop. And the project is these shell casinos that they were total disasters. It was it, um, like the one is they renovated the Sahara. One, they created one called like the Golden Dragon. They're, all they're doing is collecting Chinese money, selling green cards essentially and then the casinos fail a year later and it was a of course a huge money maker for the jewish middlemen all they're doing is selling the rights to live here and the 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 part that i i uh probably can't say is there's a government dude i know uh basically u.s intelligence completely turned a blind eye to who these chinese people were um and so I don't know how that applies to what you're saying, but yeah, the lines between random Chinese people running around buying things and the government are uh, not clear. Yeah, I mean, and and I, and yeah, I wasn't when I made that comment about the church and everything. I mean, I was being dead serious. I mean, I understand that there. Are, I mean, somebody who can throw around that kind of money, um, well, where's it coming from? That kind of thing. I mean, it doesn't escape me that 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 china is could be buying up tons of stuff in this country and has that, that's not the problem okay well but we can call that out right and let's say uh okay so this is just all by way of contrasting we actually are allowed to point out chinese group interests where if you point out uh, jewish group interests you would be uh instantly banned and censored is that the idea yeah pretty much yeah the you know i was they were talking about um just Dave distributive brought up today, you know, why are people holding on to classical liberalism and libertarianism so hard when it's so obvious that that's just, they're completely out of the game right now. It's completely out of the realm of, of reality. And yeah, I told yeah, them, I said, I, I just took your, your bait on China and I was like, no, dude, the, they're right about the Chinese. They're buying everything. But that wasn't your point, of course. No. Well, it, well, it, the, he was making he made the point about um let's say classical liberalism and libertarianism and he um and he's like what, what are they just trolling at this point and i said no they, they they literally can make this they can make this their identity they can make this their ideology and when you point out to them well there's other things at play here. There's social engineering. There is there are special interest groups, things like that. They don't want to go to that because it, you know as long as they're in cr classical liberalism and libertarianism, they're not a threat to the regime, and there's no threat to their bank accounts. Yeah. You know, so, and, so you know there's no threat to losing your banking, losing your ability to do things like that. So you know pointing out you know when you. <laughs> going further and being like well i mean we ba this government has basically been seized by you know by foreign powers um 
I mean, that's and you know, China's one of them. So you, I mean, you're not, you're not, you weren't really taking my bait on it and everything. I mean, China is one of them. China is. It's clear that Biden is in bed with China, but like you were just pointing out, there are other. There's another. There are other groups, and you specifically mentioned another group that was part of that. All, part of all these negotiations. So it's not like you know you could just say. Well, just China's doing this, and you know, we have to worry about China. No, there's other th- there are other groups there. There's other there's a lot of moving parts there, but you know it's kind of hard when you look at the Biden administration and you look at the people who are in the highest in the highest uh, seats of power within that administration to not recognize that they all seem to be part of one group. Yeah, sure. And as far as the libertarian take on it, there's just a like a deep psychological block against admitting you're you're wrong of course and i mean you're a guy who can admit he was wrong and I, you and i i am sure you and i both made libertarian arguments 10 years ago that were basically anti-racist things for example sure. um you know the problem with affirmative action is that it stigmatizes blacks like that type of thing that no that's not the problem with affirmative action they're they're even afraid to point out who the actual victims are. And so once you've spent a life, you know, reading and relaying those types of arguments, which are essentially anti-racist, it, it, it's a massive psychological hurdle to say I was wrong and groups have interests. And so, uh, yeah, God bless you for being a guy who can uh, humble yourself. Well, thanks. But, you know, even, uh, even Thomas points out that, you know, when it comes to like the deracination of culture, that blacks have lost out in this too. You know, they should have their own culture. It just shouldn't be here. I mean, they should really after slavery, they should have been sent, you know, after slavery was ended, they should have been sent somewhere, somewhere else. I mean, it's, why would you, why would you, why would you allow people to stay here who you just enslaved? You're ba- <laughs> I mean, and now the ship is so far sailed. I don't know what the answer is because they're going to have. I mean, you you can't put these people back in Africa. Of course, it would be it would be a high, high comedy. But I mean, <laughs> there's a uh, whatever the solution is. Yeah, it's gonna. Well, I'd I'd love to give them the South, but you might object to that. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm gonna have a problem with that. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna have a problem with a lot of that. But the um all right, so let's uh let, let's shift gears. Let's finish let's finish off with something um with, with something a little more interesting and offbeat here. Yes. You referred to yourself as just a simple goat farmer. <laughs> are you gonna put the part in the, uh, are we gonna tell the backstory on this episode? Uh, uh no, let's let's leave that out. Okay. But uh, um well yeah, but, so you I mean I I uh I think I'm I largely started following you due to a millennial your appearance on millennial i was aware of you and probably heard you a few times but i really loved your transition story from libertarianism to where we are now and uh i think i contacted you pretty shortly after that once i started diving into your material um but uh yeah my own life is uh you know i left gamora of vegas and bought empty land up here um bought or just built a couple barns I lived in a literal eight foot by eight foot shed for the first winter. The winter is here severe as well. It's a high altitude uh, Rockies. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm slowly building it, but it's pretty Spartan still. Yeah. But um, I mean, you, but you did it, you know, it's like so many people, I, you know, I was talking, tell, telling people to do it before I even did it, you know, and I finally got out and, um, you know, it's, it has its challenges and everything, but it's not as bad as I think people think it is. I think that um, I think one of the main one of the main problems we do and what, what we did is if you are married and if you have kids, but especially if you're married, um, your wife may the, the wife may not want to have to drive an hour to go to um, the stores that they like. Yeah, absolutely. And from my position, I, I still want to marry and have kids and I'm in my mid 40s. So it's easy for a single guy to just go off the land and start pooping in a bucket. But to then to draw a woman into your existence, you have to provide some more level of comfort than that. So that's something I'm trying to remedy quickly. And uh, 
yeah, it's not for everybody. But but I think to your earlier point, do, if people feel there's a life they want to have, just take the first step and do it. I mean, I know there are guys who like, oh, it, it must. I, I know you you listen to him, Benjamin. I used to listen to him quite a bit, but his uh, must be nice. Like that that is really a big problem where people see something that they want and they create uh reasons why it can't happen just do it just do it It, i i'm not a rich person um i spent 20 years paying a mortgage on an underwater house and when i got a little positive equity i said i'm out of here and i i sold the house and uh bought what was like reasonably priced land in 2019 it wasn't rocket science it didn't take a lot of money um and people that that say that to me like oh man i'd love to do what you're doing a lot of them have seventy thousand dollar trucks that they financed, they're going to end up spending more on that truck than I spent on my land. Yeah. So yeah, people, I don't know. I'm, I'm just agreeing with your point. Just do it. If you see something you like, take the first step. Yeah. It, um, you know, I had a conversation with friends I made around here and they, you know, asked you know, how, you know, all the places you've lived and everything, everything you've done. I mean, what, how can you live here? And it's like, you, you don't understand this. This was my goal. This has been like my, my my goal for a long time. Yeah. And and you can go back and visit whenever you want. And all that's going to do is reinforce the fact that you made the correct decision. Yeah. I mean, I'm in uh, roughly an hour and a half from Atlanta, you know, but, and really the only reason I want to go to Atlanta is for the air (laughs) to go to Atlanta ever is for the airport. Um, there's a couple of restaurants there I like, but that's not even, that's not even worth it. I mean, I've found plenty of restaurants around where I am now, um, you know, an hour and 20 to Auburn and there's a lot of stuff in Auburn and you still can have like a small town kind of feel down there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't see, especially knowing what's coming, I couldn't see being anywhere near a city. I mean, the suburbs for the most part, people think that if they're in the suburbs right now, that they, they're really safe and they may be, you know, I don't, I don't want to judge everybody, but I mean, the city became, it used to be that only certain people could afford to live in the suburbs. Now the suburbs are affordable for a lot of people. And even further, even further out than that, you know, I'm getting, I get, contact a lot of people contact me and they tell me you know it's like man my city's gone woke and everything like that and i'll ask well where are you and they'll tell me and i'll look at it on a map and i'll be like i don't know how you know but then i remember that six months i lived in ohio and i lived fairly close i I was like an hour i mean i I was i was an hour from cleveland hour and 20 minutes from cleveland um But I drove down to South Ohio and people who've never driven in Ohio don't realize that it's, it's huge. And I I stopped in a town I never heard of off of a highway that, you know, only people in Ohio know what this highway is. And I went into a Walmart and there was so many like right out of a college campus women's studies class people working there and i'm just like first of all it's going to be hard to run away from second of all we're get, at some point we're just gonna to have to defeat this yeah and um, I, I don't um, know that it's going to be defeated i don't know that the city i don't know if the cities are the best place to fight it from no, it's impossible. I, I, my advice would be is stop stop supporting that system. So, and I hate to throw a black pill in your holiday week because I know you're trying to keep it positive this week. We we will never win the political battle. You got to start planting seeds for what's coming after. That's the only way. I mean that that's the white pill is start focusing on wins you uh fights you can win, which are small and local. Like worrying about nas- anything national is a waste of your. Uh, mental energy and uh, emotional capacity. So we can point and laugh at those things. We're going to, and I'm sorry to say, it, we're going to lose on that level until there is violence or some something catastrophic. So 
yeah enjoy the show but pick local fights and uh, that's the good thing about being where you are and where i am we can find local fights and win them and those are important those are things that'll that will affect uh your neighbors and you yeah local is definitely the way to go um two reasons to watch uh to watch washington dc right now like you said the entertainment entertainment value and just to know what's coming know what could possibly be coming you know for you um really one of the best ways to find out what could be coming down the pike and people should know this by now is to watch what's ha- watch what's being passed in california yeah Calif- you're right <laughs> yeah that, california the is- spreads. that's where they that's where they draft the legislation that ends up everywhere else Yep. I mean, it's like seatbelt laws, uh, you know, raising the drinking age of 21. I mean, all this stuff is it started in California and they test it there and then it just spreads out. And what, it, what what's the one thing they've been talking about in California for the uh, last good year and a half? And I mean, they actually have councils now on it is reparations. Yeah. And <laughs> I, I, one little point of pushback is that you, you hear this in Idaho, especially as, you know, Californians get what they voted for and they ruin it there. Then they want to move up here and ruin it here. That's not what happened. If, if you look at voting patterns there, it used to be a completely red state. It was well, a white state. It was a Christian state. And when you had uh, referendums on gay marriage, they vote against it. When you have three strikes, you're out, they vote for it meaning felons go to jail for life. Anytime you threw it out to the voters, the voters were conservative. And so the people running now, they're running because the, whatever's happening in California happened despite the voters. And now that you got the demographic shift, it's an unwinnable fight. But the the whole uh, meme that like California gets what they deserve because they voted that way, totally false. Yeah. No, and I, I'm not, <clears throat> I try not to be somebody who does that. I don't know if any you've ever heard me say that. Because it's just so normicon kind of thing, and it, it just sounds so normicon when I hear people say that. Well, um, in fact, the opposite is true. The people coming, the white people who have just worked and paid taxes and tried to keep their nose down for their lifetimes, who are now finally forced to flee, they're the best thing that can come to your state because they know what's coming. That those people coming to Idaho are not the problem. So, uh, yeah, that's my point there. I still don't think that Texas and California are going to get together for the Civil War, like the movie says. <laughs> you cut out for one second. Repeat that. I said I still don't think that Texas and California, like the movie said, are going to be the ones that are going to be uh, oh. coming. <laughs> well, that's like that's the most con- that's the top voted comment on the trailer is you know people saying how does that make any sense, Texas and California? If you look at the demographics and then you see that it's the multi-culti gang fighting the white power structure it does make sense if you uh texas is gonna flip in a heartbeat nevada already did um the the demographics are there i mean that that whole uh thing that oh texas is red for life and they're (laughs) conservative latino meme texas is close on the heels of nevada uh and i think that idea of the alliance of texas and california won't seem so crazy in five years well yeah but i think that the movie and I would need to find out more about the movie is probably it would be that Texas and California or some like kind of red force or something like that. I think that the movie might try to paint it that way. Or no, may... no, that's not what's happening there. That I think that's like, that's the ambiguity, but that's not what's going on. I, well, we'll see. We'll see. I don't, I, I think it's basically, uh, I think they threw that in there for a little, so it's not an obvious red blue. That's the exact point of doing it is, to show you that they're smarter than that. Okay. Oh, interesting. We'll see. We'll see. Cool. Well, I appreciate the conversation. It's um, talking to somebody who you know, did what you know did what I did, did what a lot of other people did. Because it's funny. I would. It's like I said before. I've been talking about this and telling people to do it. I did it long before that. Long before I did it. And I had, you know, so many people contact me and say, I was able to do it. It was the best decision of my life to get out. And, um, you know, I have a family now and everything like that. And that's the kind of stuff that keeps me, keeps me going and lets me know that, um, people are out there where there's less of a chance that they can, they get and get attacked or get touched by, you know, by what's coming and, you know, 
can live a life and you know raise raise kids to you know understand what's understand what's happening and be ready to um you know to fight for civilization and uh, as opposed to what whatever this is that they're you know this just multicultural soup horror show of normalizing everything from murder and rape straight down to the absolute you know what can actually be worse than both of those and um yeah it's nice to talk to somebody who actually who did that and um you know <laughs> i mean las vegas to las vegas to rural idaho is uh is quite the uh quite the journey yeah and i'll just uh reiterate your point is that and there's a lot of the oh don't run you got to fight you, well you can do both go to where your people are and then fight the the idea is not to run and then check out of the fight it's to run and tell people what's coming build a strong community i'm not going to say things that you haven't already said a thousand times but yeah the time is now to fight and and uh you can be paul revere in whatever little town uh he's i don't know if he's the wrong guy because he was a secret mason or something but the point is you can go do really good things for small communities. Get there, volunteer, work, be white, be noble, be honest with your neighbors. They will embrace you. Go out and do it. Yeah, be be honest too. Don't try to don't don't hide. Don't don't hide what you are. Amen. Don't. I mean, it's just it's not worth it. I've let let people know as soon as I got here why I was here, and you know, yeah. and what I believe and what I believe, and just let it. You know, let them judge me. And what I found out was they weren't going to, they weren't going to judge me. They were like, no, yeah, well, welcome. Yeah. My guess is they're somewhere between indifferent and embracing you more because of it. <laughs> Appreciate it, Charlie. Thank you so much. Great time. Thanks, Pete.